Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world premiere of a great new soft drink. The world premiere of Diet Coke. Introducing Diet Coke. You're gonna drink it just for the taste of it. Well, that's enough for today. Now for a lively lift. Ice cold Coca-Cola. There's no waistline worry with Coke, you know. In a world where the food we eat is often cloaked in mysterious ingredients and hidden agendas, there is one substance that has sparked controversy and confusion for decades. On July 14, 2023, in an unexpected twist of events, the World Health Organization, WHO, threw us a little bit of a curveball and suggested that this common artificial sweetener could be giving us cancer. Mm. I'm talking about what's in your favorite diet soda, aspartame. Today, my friends, we are on a journey to uncover the truth behind this controversial sweetener. But what if I told you there is a lot more to this story than you know? What I have found out by deep diving into the history of the approval of aspartame 40 years ago stunned me even as a doctor. If we are basing the amount of aspartame that we're putting in all of these foods today on these studies, then it is a disaster. It's obvious we were being conned. And you need to know this. Let's just say the FDA and the food industry have a lot of explaining to do, all right? For years, we have been told by the FDA that aspartame is a safe and guilt-free alternative to the evils of sugar. The FDA has described aspartame as one of the most thoroughly tested and studied food additives they have ever approved. And its safety is clear cut. Now, um, that didn't age well, did it? So then how do we explain the WHO now on July 14th backtracking from aspartame being safe to now it being possibly carcinogenic? In all candor, aspartame is probably one of the most studied ingredients in, in all of food and has been for a long time. It's been deemed as safe. And even the WHO itself has said that aspartame is safe as an ingredient, so. A World Health Organization panel has labeled the common sugar substitute aspartame as possibly carcinogenic. A possible carcinogen. A potential cancer risk. The preponderance of evidence that suggests aspartame is safe. This is not gonna be a significant issue. Throughout this whole situation, there have always been two sides of this story. We have the skeptics that have maintained that aspartame is killing us, suggesting that the FDA is being unethically influenced by big food and big soda companies, maybe hiding and minimizing the true data. How can an agency regulate an industry it's being funded by? Through the years, the FDA's reliance on company money has increased. Then there's the pro-aspartame crew that suggests that aspartame is totally safe. And even with this new information, putting it in the classification of possibly carcinogenic, that that's not very meaningful. And it's just misinterpretation of the data and exaggeration of the data. That, that, that data is also currently debated. So the possibly carcinogenic, very jargony, and it doesn't mean what we say it means. Here's what the FDA said, and I'm sticking with the FDA. So, who is telling the truth? Is aspartame putting the dye in diet? Until their client either buys or fucking dies! Let's investigate. On July 14th, 2023, the World Health Organization, WHO and IARC released their statements about aspartame after reevaluating its safety. The overall take home message here was aspartame may possibly cause cancer and is added to the possibly carcinogenic category, but it is still safe to consume. Um, what? You might be like, huh? This is really confusing. And yeah, it is confusing. But the truth is in the details. In general, the WHO says we are just advising for a bit of moderation. Basically, they are saying they have currently found some evidence that aspartame may be associated with cancer or what they describe as limited evidence, 
but that evidence is not fully conclusive yet and more studies are needed, which is why they put it in the possibly carcinogenic category. The main concern from looking at the study they just published seems to be about a possible association with aspartame consumption and liver cancer, but they also found statistically significant increases in cancers such as breast and blood cancers like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and multiple myeloma in some studies that they looked at. They mainly looked at three studies, and these were good quality studies that did control for what we call confounding factors, meaning other factors that could be influencing the data or causing the results. But despite this, the WHO says they couldn't rule out that there were some confounding or biasing factors at play here that may have led to the results of aspartame being associated with these specific cancers. That is why they decided to list it as possibly carcinogenic for now. They are hoping for more research to be done on aspartame in this area so that we can eventually conclusively say one way or the other. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a big fat, we really don't know yet. Maybe, maybe not. Um, uh, we're not sure. And interestingly, they concluded that the previously established upper daily limit of 40 milligrams per kilogram per day of aspartame was still appropriate and they did not change that. In general, they are saying people don't have to stop it completely, but should be mindful of how much they are consuming because there may be a possible link there with cancer. And really only time will tell. This is not the first time aspartame has been shrouded in confusion and contradiction. It gets even wilder, my friends, if you can believe that. And this is important for you to know because we need to know how did we even get here? This story actually starts many years ago. I'm talking 40 years ago when the FDA first approved aspartame. And let me tell you, that was a controversial time. To say it lightly, let's head back to the 60s. Aspartame was accidentally discovered in 1965 by chemist James Schlatter while working for G.D. Searle and Company, a pharmaceutical company. Now make sure to remember that name, Searle and Co. Because there's another S word that their company reminds me of, and that's shady. The Searle scientist was developing a new anti-ulcer drug when he accidentally licked his finger. Sure sounds like a guy who follows safety protocols in the lab, right? And he realized that the substance he was working with, aspartame, tasted sweet. In fact, it tasted 200 times as sweet as sugar. Searle & Co. started to see that money. That's right, they realized that they just hit the jackpot. So of course, Searle did some research on it and then submitted their application to the FDA for it to be approved as a sweetener for dry foods in 1973. And luckily for them, the FDA approved it rather quickly, just based on the studies submitted by Searle. Yes, that's right, you heard me right. The FDA approved a brand new food additive as safe just based on studies by the company that created it and stands to make a huge profit off of it. Wait, wait, isn't that a huge conflict of interest? Yeah, I think? Yeah. But wait, maybe we should be giving the FDA the benefit of the doubt back then. I mean, maybe they're just like that overly trusting friend that's always giving their partner the benefit of the doubt. You know, even when he's like, no, I swear, I was just working late. I mean, I was out with the boys. I mean, my phone died. No, that's not red lipstick on my shirt. Um, yeah, except in this case, the general public's lives are at stake when the FDA decides to play fast and loose with their trust. As uh, history shows that pharmaceutical and food companies never do us wrong. They're always trustworthy. High moral standards there, for sure. Big surprise, that genius approach by the FDA really backfired on them. People started to figure out that maybe those studies by Searle weren't all that great in the first place, and maybe Searle kind of massaged the data or really didn't do the studies that properly. Either a lot of purposeful shenanigans was carried on to get this product approved, or it was the world's worst research. The animals that died after being fed NutraSweet they didn't autopsy the animals right away. Some of them were not autopsied more than a year afterwards. And of course the tissues broke down and, and liquefied. They reported these as normal. They were taking tumors and cutting them out and throwing them away and saying the animal was normal. Animal tissues that had obvious tumors in it that were reported normal. It was an effort 
to cover up what was being found so that they could get approval. There were so many things wrong with the submitted data from G.D. Searle originally. They had a monkey study. The monkeys were drinking aspartame and milk. Out of the seven monkeys they had, I think one or two died and four or five had grand mal seizures. The FDA realized, oopsie, we made a mistake. And you know, in fact, there were serious deficiencies in Searle's operations and practices. Certainly, if anybody had tried to make this up, they couldn't have. They would have had to do it better. Any reputable toxicologist giving a completely objective evaluation of this data could conclude anything other than that the study was uninterpretable and worthless and should be repeated. It's obvious we were being conned. To me, that's basically a polite way of saying your study sucked and you're shady bro, but uh, we approved you so um, that's awkward. With pressure and backlash mounting from the public, that forced the FDA to rescind or put a hold on the approval of aspartame in 1975. They made Searle go back into the lab and do more, better studies this time. Sounds like a good idea, right? Searle, the first time your study sucked and you know, you kind of used shady practices, maybe resulting in the data being altered. But this time, we trust you. Make sure you go back and do things properly. Don't be shady this time, Searle. Sounds like a recipe for success if you ask me. So Searle was forced to do more studies. And in fact, a few years later, based on the new studies, the FDA did in fact approve them once again in 1981. But this approval was even more shady than the first time around. Because in order to determine aspartame safety this time, a public board of inquiry was formed comprised of scientific experts to figure out aspartame's effects on the brain and whether it caused brain cancer. This is a good thing because having a board of experts that don't have ties to pharmaceutical or food companies can help decrease the bias, but only if you actually listen to them. The board concluded that aspartame did not cause brain damage, but believed that aspartame studies did not conclusively show aspartame did not cause brain cancer, and in fact ruled that aspartame might cause cancer. Basically, what they felt was that the studies weren't convincing enough to say one way or the other. They weren't convinced that it didn't cause cancer or that it did cause cancer, and so they wanted more studies. So shockingly, the expert panel actually voted to revoke aspartame's approval and stated that aspartame should not be marketed anymore until further more conclusive safety studies have been done. So how did it get approved in the end, you ask? Well, this is where a powerful character comes into play by the name of Dr. Hull Hayes. Yes, he was a doctor and he was the big honcho, the FDA commissioner, the guy at the top of the FDA who could make all the decisions if he wanted to and he sure liked that power. Dr. Arthur Hayes was controversial to say the least. He was FDA commissioner between 1981, which is the time aspartame got approved, and 1983. So he heard the board's scientific opinion to not approve aspartame, and in fact, the board's suggestion to rescind approval, but basically he took it and threw it straight in the trash. So with his power in 1981, he overruled the board's ruling, finding aspartame unsafe and went ahead on his jolly way, approving aspartame as a sweetener, despite all the other people's concerns. In fact, three of the five people advising him stated Searle studies did not conclusively show that aspartame did not cause brain tumors. So more than the majority of his close advisors were not even convinced of aspartame's safety conclusively, but the FDA commissioner still decided to go ahead with it. Literally, this dude single-handedly decided to be like, you know what, let's throw caution to the wind and let's just approve aspartame, despite what other people are saying. Maybe he was just really trusting of the studies by Searle, right? I mean, there can't be any other motives there. We all know Searle was an upstanding company and always was so rigorous in their lab studies. Let me give you this little cherry on top. When he was asked after he made the approval decision, he said, and I quote, I had to make a decision because if you wait for unanimity, nothing ever is going to happen. Sounds like sound scientific reasoning to me. Look, all the scientists don't agree, but you know what? I've got better things to do and this is taking far too long for my liking. So let's just uh, approve it. 
then we can be done with it, right? Being the head of the FDA, Dr. Hay's views were concerning to many because one of his goals was to try to get faster drug approvals, leading to many accusations of favoring the pharmaceutical industry. Now you'd think that Dr. Hayes couldn't get more controversial. Well, you'd be wrong. In his tenure as FDA commissioner for those three years, he was responsible for many other disasters, including the approval of the anti-arthritis drug Oraflex, only to learn of reports later that the drug caused deaths and adverse reactions in Britain. Good job there. You know, seems like maybe taking some extra time to approve new drugs might be a good idea after all. You know, when it comes to, um, people not dying. He then resigned in 1983 because of all this controversy and backlash. And guess where he went after? To continue his noble fight for human health? No, no. His true love turned out to be the pharmaceutical companies that he was so accused of favoring. He ended up going to work for pharmaceutical companies and held leadership roles at those companies. And there are even accusations that he actually worked with Searle after he left the FDA. Now, I can't find conclusive proof of that because he actually denied it, but there does seem to potentially be something there, or at least he may have worked with a company that Searle worked with. Anyway, regardless, to me, that's too close for comfort and an FDA commissioner should not be going on to work for pharmaceutical companies, especially the company they were responsible for approving. And because of how controversial he was, he was actually investigated, specifically regarding allegations of financial impropriety and conflicts of interest, such as accepting free travel and lodging from industry trade groups, double billing, and questionable reimbursements for private speaking engagements and conferences. He basically was out there living the high life on Big Pharma and Big Foods bill. But turns out no formal action was taken against him. And obviously that means he's totally innocent. What happened to Searle, you may be asking? Well, they ended up being acquired by another pharmaceutical company that we know today, Pfizer. I was absolutely dumbfounded to find out how sketchy the approval process of aspartame was over 40 years ago, but to this day, it was still maintained despite that. Some of the panel members back in the day were actually interviewed years later and said, it's unlikely that the tumor issue is really a high risk one, but it would have been more comforting if there had been a little bit more irrefutable proof. Yeah, I mean, I'm not so keen on the FDA throwing caution to the wind when it comes to brain tumors either, but hey, pick your battles. Now we covered the shady history of aspartame's approval, but the pro aspartame side does actually have some points that we should talk about as well. Usually there are two sides to every story. There have in fact been many studies done on aspartame since the 60s. Many of them have not linked aspartame to increased rates of cancer, although some have. However, there is criticism that the studies are highly influenced and funded by big food and big soda companies, making the data really hard to interpret in either direction. It's so powerful is its close relationship with, with the uh, FDA and other regulators in Washington. Uh, as you may know, over the past 40 years, nine out of the last 10 FDA commissioners went on to work for the pharmaceutical industry. The pro aspartame side defends the approval of aspartame back in 1981, citing that the alleged problems in Searle studies wouldn't have actually changed the outcome of the results on aspartame safety. And that if people stay within the recommended daily dose set out by the FDA for aspartame, which by the way is 50 milligrams per kilogram per day or 40 milligrams per kilogram per day in Europe, then aspartame is totally safe. That's their perspective. And many people on the pro aspartame train feel that even with the new WHO classification as possibly carcinogenic, that that's not that concerning because they claim it doesn't actually mean that it causes cancer. It's just maybe it does, but the data isn't really conclusive. Another critique is that the WHO classification doesn't really quantify the amounts as in how much aspartame would you need to consume for it to be possibly carcinogenic. And to be fair, there are other common items that we know that are on the possibly carcinogenic list by the WHO, including Asian pickled vegetables and aloe vera. But I think that's an important point is that we don't know and that there could be a possible link, meaning more studies need to be done. If more studies need to be done to assure us that it is safe, well, 
why is it approved already then? So the criticism and controversy of aspartame continue as all throughout history. So really with considering both sides, the pro and the anti aspartame, where are we really at? Well, to be honest with you, it's all kind of a hot mess. I mean, a sugar free sticky mess. The truth is the answer to does aspartame cause cancer is quite difficult to figure out in part because there is too much influence from the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry on the FDA and on the studies. In fact, a lot of food industry companies fund the studies on aspartame safety. That does make it difficult to trust the data. It doesn't mean the data is not accurate, but we know from a history that these companies cannot always be trusted, unfortunately. So my best assessment for you is yes, it does seem like there is a possible link with cancer with aspartame. It seems to be especially with liver cancer and maybe some other specific cancers, but it is really difficult to quantify this risk. It could be very small and inconsequential, or it could be bigger than we think. I do suspect that at low levels and consumed infrequently or rarely, it's probably not going to have a major effect on you in terms of causing cancer. That is the case with most things in moderation if you're not over consuming it each day. At least that's what things are showing right now. If you consume a lot of aspartame, keep in mind it can be in a lot of different products, then you might really want to be a lot more mindful of your consumption. To me, what the WHO is basically saying is, yes, it could possibly cause cancer, but we really don't know how big that risk is. It seems small, but you know what? We just don't know fully. So more studies are needed. Now, this does not mean you should go back to eating sugar because there is conclusive proof that sugar is not good for us and has many negative health consequences for us. But there are many other alternatives such as sparkling water, just plain water, water with lemon, bubbly sodas that have natural flavoring. And you should also know that the WHO actually also found that unfortunately, replacing sugar with aspartame and similar sweeteners does not really aid in weight loss. But this story does not just end at does aspartame cause cancer? There is a deeper and more disturbing question here. The big question is, can we even trust these regulatory bodies when at one point they tell us something is safe only to backtrack on it and later say, you know what? We actually don't really know and maybe it is carcinogenic. What does that say about them? How can an agency regulate an industry it's being funded by? It's becoming more and more clear that the trust is damaged in organizations that are meant to protect us. As a doctor, I find this very concerning. To me, it seems like the approach that these regulatory agencies like the FDA take are similar to innocent until proven guilty or healthy until proven toxic. And you know what? That is not really the approach I want them to be taking to the food and drugs they approve for public consumption. While I am all for advancement of science and myself am a researcher, advancement in science, especially when it comes to non-life-saving treatments or food additives that aren't meant to be life-saving, it should never be at the expense of human health. There is too much influence from the soda and food and drug companies on the FDA. They should not be having a mutually supportive relationship because that is highly unethical. This lack of transparency is exactly why we are going from it's totally safe to now the WHO throwing a curveball and saying it's possibly carcinogenic. The best advice that I can give you is be informed about your health. Try not to overconsume one particular food or product because often the poison is in the dose. So usually in situations, even if it turns out that something is possibly carcinogenic or even probably carcinogenic, if you're not over consuming it, your risk will likely be low. And make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you can find out the truth about all your pressing health issues. Stay curious, stay informed, and don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe.